going to open with a hymn. So please find your seats and then join me and rise as you're able. And we'll sing Christ Has Broken Down the Wall, 3122 from the Green Worship and Song Hymnal. as one Christ has broken down the wall we're accepted as we are we're accepted as we are through God's love all is reconciled we're accepted as we are. Cast aside your doubts and fears. Cast aside your doubts and fears. Peace and love freely offered here. Cast Side your thoughts and fears. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome. I'm Pastor Eric. Pastor Laura is out this Sunday. Uh, I'm so glad to be uh, together in the house of the Lord with all of you. Uh, if you're new with us or those of you at home, uh, please know that there's a place for you here at St. Paul's, that this is a place where we recognize that uh, each and every person has gifts, dignity, and worth made in the image of God, and, and we need you. Uh, we are better with you in the, in the unique voice and, and part that you bring. And so, uh, particularly if you're new, if you would um, scan in, uh, that QR code, let us know that you're here. You can also offer prayer requests um, to my email for the prayer guide that I send out each week. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and help you get connected because there's a lot going on. Um, I'll just run through a couple of things that you will see in the Friday newsletter if you, if you get those. Um, yesterday, we had a wonderful day at uh, Johnson County Pride picnic in the park at Sarkopar Park. Thank you. It was great. We had a booth out there, and, and I think it's really important for the community to see that there are churches like ours um, looking to uh, include all and, and particularly the LGBTQ community. Um, so thanks uh, for that. Today, the fun continues. If you're looking for places to connect, uh, I think there are still tickets, um, not maybe in the section, but, but come to the Kansas City Current game where um, Jackson and uh, Casey Vitas, the choir that he directs, will be doing the national anthem this afternoon at 4 o'clock at Children's Mercy Park. So would love to see you, to see you there. Lots happening this, this week. Um, oh, and I should say, since I just like walked in basically late, um, I'm teaching a class during that 10 o'clock hour on divine reading, getting into scripture together. We had a wonderful time this morning, and there are two more sessions of that. So um, our last sermon series was Linger Longer. I'd invite you to, again, I'm still trying to think of the word for pre-linger, if anyone knows whatever that word is. But come early uh, next week, and, um, and, and we'll, we'll get into scripture together in the practice of divine reading for two more Sundays. So I'm doing that in that, in that 10 o'clock hour. Pastor Laura has also started a short-term study on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock here at the church, uh, talking about the, the state of the United Methodist Church and where we are in the denomination, what it means for us as a church like St. Paul's to be working for full inclusion uh, and for change in our denomination. And so um, check that out. On uh, I think this week, uh, Jesse, are you talking? I think we're bringing our delegates maybe, uh, that you and, and Pastor Carter... Awesome. So we get to hear from Jesse, our own Jesse Lipp, one of our conference delegates, um, and, uh, and it should be a good time on Tuesday night. Thursday night, uh, 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 Professor Miguel de la Torre from Iliff Seminary is here uh, at Central, I think is the name of the seminary, um, uh, here in Lenexa, and he is uh, talking about uh, how we are called to reject white supremacy and Christian, na uh, and Christian nationalism. And so that'll be a challenging and good talk on Thursday. Uh, similarly, Saturday, uh, uh, Dialogue Institute, our, um, 
ongoing conversation and community with our Muslim brothers and sisters. Uh, they have invited us to an event at um, uh, Leewood UMC on Saturday talking about um, genocide and human rights violations in Turkey. That would be another good thing to check out. That morning on Saturday, you can come to The Hub, one of our partners in Argentine. We have a serve day from 9 a.m. to noon on Saturday. Uh, and so lots of great things happening and places to get connected and places we need your help. And so I um, invite you to get that newsletter and check it out and join us for any and all of those good things. I'll look forward to seeing you there. As we uh, get into worship together, uh, we come to this time and we start a new sermon series with Pastor Mike preaching today. Uh, as we talk about our need in our world and in our lives for reconciliation, for healing for the relationships to be restored that that God intended us for and um, it takes getting honest with some real wounds some real harm that has been done uh, but we can do that in confidence uh, knowing that by God's grace uh, God can restore and heal and offer hope and so uh, it's my prayer that each of us would uh, get a glimpse of that hope um, that uh, in our families in our workplaces in our communities places that we're experiencing conflict, we can be honest about it, um, but that we would, we would begin to see that, um, that there's a place for healing uh, in those, those long battles. So we give that to God, and we give this time to God, and I'm thankful to be here with you. Oh, and we have a call to worship. <laughs> and I'm back. A love that never ceases, a creativity that designed the universe. These are the things that are of God. So together, let us worship God. Amen. All right, now please join me in a familiar tune for everyone born. For everyone born a place at the table. For everyone born clean water and bread. A shelter, a space, a safe place for growing. For everyone born a star. and joy, compassion, and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy. For young and for old, a place at the table, a voice to be heard, a part in the song. The hands of a child in hands that are wrinkled, for young and for old, the right to belong. And God and joy, compassion, and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For gay and for straight, a place at the table, a covenant shed, a welcoming space, a rainbow of race and gender and color, for gay and for straight, a chalice of grace. 
God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. Let us now join together in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. connection we'll meet at the back of the sanctuary and our with our leaders and we'll head downstairs and for everyone I'd like to invite us to sing together Jesus loves the little children which is adapted each week from the words of our welcome statement Jesus loves the little children painful past love and mercy always last jesus loves the little children of the world jesus loves the little children all the children of the world you may have a painful past grace and mercy always last jesus loves the little children of the Hi everybody, my name is Jackson Thomas, if you don't know who I am. Um, I just completed my seventh year here at St. Paul's, or started my eighth, which is really surprising. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to um, introduce myself to people that are new, and also to say kind of like what I do. Um, technically my title is the director of choral music, but I also direct the orchestra and the bell choir, and um, wanted to keep an invitation that's open at any point, uh, to any of you that might be interested in being part of one of our ensembles for the traditional worship service. And so um, one of those is the chancel choir and we meet every Wednesday and we sing at every, um, every 11 o'clock service as, as many of you know. Um, the bell choir rehearses every Wednesday night as well and, but we only ring during mostly the um, fourth Sunday of every month. Um, and then the orchestra, we meet on the Sunday morning that we play, and that's normally on the third Sunday of every month. But um, all that's to say is that there is a spot for you in every single one of those ensembles if you are interested in doing so. And um, I think that anybody in, involved would be, uh, might be able to tell you that they're acutely aware that this is a way that they worship, right? Um, and serve at the same time. And so... Uh, we believe that music allows us to uh, become closer to God and to, to grow in our faith. And so if you are, are called to do that, we would love to have you join us. Um, I have to leave because of the game very soon after the service. Um, so normally I would be okay, like would love to 
to chat and everything like that, but I kind of have to beeline. Um, but would love to chat with you on a different Sunday or Jackson at stpaulsonexa.org um, is my email address. Would love to get you connected. What I do want to say is that um, it is very flexible. So if you're like, you know, I'm going to have to miss X amount of weeks or something like that, we can absolutely work with that. Um, the bells especially are, you know, you sign on for a month kind of thing. Um, and so if you're not playing that month, then you don't have to come to rehearsal, etc. And we always work ahead in, in chancel choir. So even if you're not going to be there for, you know, a couple of weeks, we can get you caught up and we're working on music for well in advance. Um, anyway, I just wanted to open that invitation. It is open whether it's now or in the future. Um, so please get in contact. We would love to have you in one of our ensembles. Thank you.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Hello, everyone. It is good to be with you this morning. Uh, for those of you whom I haven't met, my name is Mike Marcus. I am uh, your deacon in residence, uh, which means I uh, attend, I am committed to the work of St. Paul's, but my appointment as a uh, member of the United Methodist Church uh, is elsewhere. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. And so um, with that, we are in the midst of our reconciliation series. This is our first week where we're going to be talking about what does reconciliation look like within communities. And so with that, our scripture passage for this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, uh, 22 through 31. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he, that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of the joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen the face of God, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose up upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Makes sense, right? I don't, I don't need to expand on that one. We, under, we got it? Okay. Almost one year ago to the day, I started my new appointment at a nonprofit in Kansas City known as Reconciliation Services. And to any of you, because I know among all of us, there have been quite a number of us who have changed careers or changed director, trajectories uh, in the course of the pandemic. I'm sure some of us have had that moment where we've asked ourselves, what have we gotten ourselves into? I know I had those moments very quickly and in rapid succession, adapting to a whole new kind of work environment, figuring out what kind of role uh, I would actually serve, figuring out how to fit into this new team that is radically different from anything I have previously experienced in the service industry, in the church. It was all new to me. And of course, throw in on top of that, we were running a donate what you can venue on the historic, racial, and socioeconomic dividing line of our city. And that is a lot to handle. The other beautiful part of making a change like this into the unknown and sometimes uncomfortable was that I got to see a whole different part of how Kansas City functions and how the nonprofit world works, and how complementary the church can be when working together with social agencies in our community. And additionally, I've begun to learn more and more, as many of us have over the last few years, educating ourselves over racism and socioeconomic issues, and how no individual story or interaction should be handled at face value. For me, reconciliation services, reconciliation is in the name. In the 80s, it started as a ministry of the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, that was started in this building on Troost, uh, serving hot meals and providing services uh, however the early members of this church could provide them. Over time, it transformed and became a non-profit agency that had therapists, social workers, case managers. They run a foster grandparents program, a social leader educational program, and of course, Thelma's Kitchen, which is a donate what you can cafe named for one of the founders, Thelma. And part of my role in this setting is education. And so a lot of you have met my family. Uh, they've attended St. Paul's for a while. I come from a family of educators, and so this part is really special for me. It's a way that I kind of get to bring in that piece of education that was so important to me growing up. And what I get to do is provide education for our friends and neighbors about the historical issues that have led to the divide created by Troost Avenue, Kansas City's racial and socioeconomic dividing line. Weekly, I get to present to companies, 
churches, friend groups, other organizations, and I get to talk to them about issues that are prevalent in our community. And I'll usually somewhere along the lines of this presentation ask the question, how many of you have lived in KC for at least five years? Okay. How about 10 years? Keep your hand up. 10 years? Your whole life. Okay. Now, I ask, I ask everyone, keep your hands up. I want to see how many of you who have lived in KC your whole life. How many of you have heard the term redlining before? Now, St. Paul's, this, this is an anomaly because <laughs> on a good day, on a good day of all the hands that are raised, generally about 30% of them stay up when I, when I ask them what the term redlining means. I don't say this to shame or oust these individuals. I say these to draw attention to the fact that this is something that is not well talked about in many parts of our community. We can't learn something if we don't know that we need to learn it. For those new to the topic of redlining, especially the ones who have lived in KC their whole life, that this is a new term, it feels like a slap in the face. How did I not know about this? How are people not talking about this? We are, but... And how is this still a thing? Over the past year, I've adjusted my presentation as I start to learn what our community is aware of. I, I've learned to adjust my presentation, include different pieces of information that resonate with different groups. And one day when I was researching, I found a database that had, the, uh, that had some census data that, that really struck me. And so on the screen, you're gonna see a map. Now, this is, a, this is what's called a racial dot map, and this uh, breaks down population uh, by race. And every orange dot that you see on, the, on mostly the left side of the screen, that is representative of white households. That uh, it represents communities broken down block by block and the population distribution. Now, on the right side, you're gonna see a lot of yellow dots. And this is representative of black households and African American households. This data is from the 2020 census. Yes, this is still a thing because this map here, it has some highways on it. You can see the lines. There are no streets on this map, but I would guarantee almost every person in this room, if I gave you a laser pointer, you could tell me right where Truce Avenue cuts through our city. Yes, this is still a thing. And we, as a community of faith, we've done a lot of work uh, about educating ourselves about this important topic. And when we, when we look at this, we can't help but recognize this process, this, this, this process of redlining that has literally drawn a line in, in our community still exists today. St. Paul's, when we encounter our scripture passage for today, we encounter a rightfully nervous Jacob. Jacob has returned to his homeland to face his brother after he robbed Esau of everything. Jacob sent gifts of oxes and donkeys. He sent messengers to tell Esau about Jacob's arrival. And when the messengers returned, they informed Jacob, your brother is ready, all right. Him and about 400 of the buddies are waiting for you. Cue panic. So he increases the gift. He sends more, more, more. 220 goats, 220 rams, camels, colts, cows, bulls, more and more donkeys. Where he gets them from, I don't know. As his servants, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not strong on the agriculture side, all right? As his servants leave with them, he sends his wives his maids, his children, and all of his possession, and he is left alone. And that is where we encounter our scripture passage for today. Jacob is a man alone, afraid, curious, wondering what's going to happen next. And we read in the passage that Jacob wrestles with an unknown man through the night. Now, we could run every literacy test, every idea, every concept about the details of this passage, about who this man is, but at its core, Jacob sees God through this encounter. 
Now, I don't know what kind of WrestleMania they had going on in biblical times, but as the mysterious man sees that he is not going to emerge victorious, he strikes Jacob on the hip, dislocating it. And Jacob doesn't stop. Even in the midst of the pain and the man telling him to let him go, Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob, this liar, this schemer, this person who struggled with God through the course of his life, had the audacity and the tenacity to ask for a blessing from this mysterious stranger. And he receives that blessing and the scar to tell the tale. Have you ever experienced something so strongly, some, some conflict, some confrontation that has left a permanent mark on you? It could be physical, mental, spiritual. But there are moments in our lives that sometimes carry the most weight, and we walk away from that changed. But we normally carry the scar of that encounter as well. Jacob, when he left his community, he left his community fractured and divided. He left relationships undone, conflicts unresolved. And up, up to this moment, he flees from the face of the ugly truth of the reality of his own machinations that are catching up with him. However, he is different. He is a different person from the one who fled this community before. And for a moment, he is willing to face the difficulty of a conflict that has been left undone before him. Cities across the country remain segmented and divided. We are not alone when I show you this map. There are 388 other cities in, in the U.S., that experience the same systematic process of redlining. And there are maps like this that will tell that tale of how those lasting ramifications uh, are still symptomatic today. Scheming, lying, deception for personal and unequal gain were able to weave themselves into the fabric of our schools, of our cities, and our communities and create divisions that still remain today. There are roots to this issue. This is not a simple problem to solve. There are roots that have to be pulled if, it, if this is going to be addressed. And the same goes for the story of Jacob. Scripture tells us very, very clearly, very explicitly, that when Jacob and Esau were born, their father favored Esau, and their mother favored Jacob. So should it really come as so much of a surprise that there, there, there would be this kind of disagreement between them, this kind of discord in their relationship? They were pitted against each other, like pawns in a game, in many ways that they would not understand in their youth. There are roots to these issues. There are roots to these problems. And so with this, with the map that shows the reality of our community, the divide that literally draws a line through our city, how then are we called to reconcile in the midst of all of these things? I know my instinct is, is for myself, it's very similar to Jacob. I, I just want to throw things at the problem more, more, more. How can we throw more money at the problem? How can we find more resources? How can we recruit more people to be involved and walk away feeling just a little bit better? just a little bit better about our place in the world. Oftentimes, doing this, throwing more, 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 more ways to separate ourselves from the underlying conflict, the roots of the issue, and, and just walk away feeling a little bit better. I know I'm guilty of that. But that's not reconciliation. And that's not how reconciliation happens. It's a little bit messier than that. Maybe as Jacob stood there that night, pacing, worrying, fretting over what would happen in his account encounter with Esau, he began asking himself some of the same questions. How can I throw more at this problem? How can I resolve this in the least messy way possible? Enter our mysterious challenger in the corner. However, we see this visage, a metaphor of internal struggle, a stranger with a bone to pick, pun intended, or God themselves come to give Jacob one more lesson and 
one more direction. We are confronted with the reality in this situation. Jacob could have let him go. But he didn't. He held on with a stubborn, unyielding grip and demanded a blessing from this man. And the next day, marked by the limp that had been bestowed on him from this injury, as well as the blessing that had been given to him, Jacob confronted Esau. And if you've read the story, you know what happens. Rather than striking him down, which, let's be real, Esau had every reason to. In in this setting, in this culture, Jacob hadn't stolen his birthright and his blessing. And that's like it. That's your inheritance. That's your savings. That's all the property you've got to your name. That's, that's the car. That's the family dog. You've got everything that was taken from him. Esau had every reason to strike him down in that moment. Probably would have been justified too. I don't have siblings. So I don't know. Maybe Maybe you feel differently. Jacob, instead, as he approaches his brother, he prostrates himself and he apologizes. But before he can get a word out, Esau wraps him in a bear hug. And they both start weeping together in this act of raw compassion. Me, I know as I I, I read this passage, this next part of the passage, I said, really, that's your reaction to all of this? A lifetime of conflict and discord. And this is how you greet your brother who has caused you so much strife, so much unnecessary loss in your life. But that's the interesting piece of this. As I, as I kept rereading, trying to make sense of why Esau would do this thing, why he would embrace compassion in this moment when he had been robbed of everything, I realized we don't have Esau's side of the story. We don't get to see what Esau has been doing this entire time that his brother has been striking it out on his own. We don't get to see the way that his views, his perspective, his understanding of the world has been changed over time. When we look at this passage and we consider what it took for Jacob to make this step, it is not an easy and clear-cut decision. Surely none of us, we've never been in a relationship where we, we... knew we needed to enter into conflict, but we really didn't want to. We are, right? We just dive into conflict head first all the time, right? Maybe that's with family or friends, a partner, a coworker. Think about what it takes to steal yourself before entering into that conflict and that confrontation. The mental work that you have to do Sometimes the physical work, the deep breathing, if you're someone who gets like super anxious in conflict, the deep breathing you have to do to center yourself and be ready for that confrontation. But let's take it a step further and ask, what does it take to prepare ourselves for the reality that that person may have changed too? What if they changed too? See, the work of reconciliation is not easy work. It is something that cannot be done alone. We can't just say, oh, I'm reconciled with them. I haven't talked to them in four years. That's not how it works. It takes, it's something that takes effort. A willingness to be vulnerable. A willingness to admit that where we may have fallen short and where our communities have fallen short is not the end. We have to be vulnerable. We have to be willing to acknowledge where we have not taken that step forward, where we should have say, this is messed up. But it is important, direly important work in our communities. As people of faith, this story is also an indicator that God is part of this relationship, part of this healing, part of this reconciliation. To be involved in faith, to continue upholding onto the principles of being in a relationship, even when it seems difficult. And sometimes part of that discomfort is what lends ourselves to being open to change. And I say this as a caveat. Let me also say, when I say staying in a relationship and the discomfort, I mean if you are safe. There's a difference between being safe and being uncomfortable. And if you are ever feeling unsafe for your well-being, that is a whole different issue. That is a whole different thing. Being uncomfortable sometimes means we are allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, especially in conflict where we are seeking to be reconciled. And that kind of discomfort 
can be holy. God is there in the discomfort. When we call out and ask God, why am I going through this? It is totally fine. As Beth Tanner, she is a a theologian and a professor of Old Testament, she says, yes, we can be angry with God, and we can tell God we do not understand the way the world works. By being honest, we are struggling to hang on in the mysterious when the world or God's methods or God's kingdom doesn't make sense. Remaining faithful through our lives is something that takes work and takes perseverance. Jacob knows this. His relationship with God is not one we think of when we think of like a formally pious person, but it was directional. Jacob knew from his family to follow and to trust in God, even if he had to take the time to figure out what it meant for him. And I assure you, we all have different paths to that realization. When you hear this passage and this idea of Esau and Jacob's realization, it probably means something different to each one of us based on the relationships that we have had, the moments that we have had conflict. I know for me, it connects with that map and it connects with the idea of reconciliation and the long road that we have in front of us to make sure our community has shared an equal access to the resources to have a fruitful and meaningful life. Maybe for you, It's asking God for a blessing as you struggle with conflict with someone in your life. Maybe it's the conversation that you need to have at work. Maybe it's learning more. Maybe it's connecting with the presentation that's going to happen this week with Miguel de la Torre. Or maybe it's volunteering with the hub and seeing the way that access-based community development impacts our communities. And maybe it's finally taking that step to reaching out to a volunteer coordinator for an organization that aligns with your passions. And if that's the case, come talk to me after service because I know almost all of them in the city at this point. Or maybe your conflict is different. Maybe it's saying no so that you can take the time you need for yourself to have that wrestling with God. If you're extroverted like me and you're just happy to be around people on a regular basis, like I've been doing all my, spending all my time doing that, maybe it's taking that energy to say no so that you can still find that time to be alone and to listen. Maybe you've done enough listening and it's time to act. God walks with us and sometimes we wrestle with God in the midst of this to figure these things out. But as we talk about reconciliation and what it means to be reconciled, there is a discomfort in the process. As Jacob learned with the strike on his hip, we don't always walk away the same from those conflicts. Sometimes we are moved, we are changed, we are transformed. Reconciliation that comes from a relationship with God is marked by the willingness to move forward, to not hold on to those past grudges and have tainted relationships. In the sense of community, it takes a willingness to come to the table and have those uncomfortable conversations, to look at the face of the discord that has come long before us and say, you do not have power over us here. We can, we will, and we must be better than what has come before. Our God is a God of relationship and compassion, and that love comes at the cost of being changed and transformed by it. Jacob was changed. Esau was changed, even though we don't get the full story about how he changed. And as the two finally, after years, get a chance to come face to face with each other, the interaction goes far differently than at least I anticipated. I don't know about you. Reconciliation within the community looks a lot like being willing to have difficult conversations. And more than that, it looks like being willing to act on them. It looks like places like St. Paul's learning about the history that they had nothing to do with directly, but learning how it continues to permeate into today's world. It looks like being willing to say, now that we have learned this, where do we go from here? And who else needs to be invited to the table? 
I was struck by today's hymn, and I want, to, I want you guys to hear, I know sometimes when we sing, we get into that rhythm, but I want you guys to hear these words from the hymn that we sung this morning. For everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, clean water and bread. A shelter, a space, a safe place for growing. For everyone born, a star overhead. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy. In seminary, one of the phrases, actually the phrase that stuck with me the most, was the idea of communities of accountability. These are places in which we are held accountable. And they can look different in different parts of our lives. Communities of accountability can look like families, or work, or your congregation, or civic organizations, or your friend group. Any space in which you are held accountable and that makes decisions that impact others. As a community of accountability, our church body tasks us with the idea of reconciliation and forgiveness. We are called to be change makers. We are called to be agitators in our community when it comes to issues of equity and injustice. And one of the principal ways that we create lasting change from these moments is addressing, uh, is addressing issues through reconciliation. Not sweeping things under the rug, but addressing issues and ensuring voices are heard and learning to move forward together. It involves, much like Jacob, asking God to bless us, even though we don't fully understand or know where we are going, and anticipating that God's presence will reside among us as we continue to move forward. At reconciliation services, we have a phrase that we use. Our hope is to turn the dividing line into a gathering place. The work of reconciliation is challenging and difficult work, but it is worthwhile work. It is indeed, like we see with Jacob, a struggle, but it is crucial to seeing the presence of God within each person that we meet, regardless of where they come from. We, as a community of faith, are motivated by our love of God and love of God's creation. When we deny one, we are causing harm to the other. And when we engage with one, we often find the other standing before us. This is the challenge of faith. But it is a lifelong process. Emphasis on the long. That requires us to continue to learn and to grow and to change. Jacob is far from perfect, but he continues to stay in the fight and be open to the change that led him back to his brother on that day. What will you find when we engage with the gaps and the divides that we find in our own communities of accountability? Amen. This morning... We come to a time of responding to the word, responding in the ways that are meaningful to us and create impact in our community. At the front and the back of the sanctuary, we have candles. I would invite you during this time of music to reflect. Reflect on the places that you have conflict or maybe need reconciliation in your own life. And then ask the question, how do I engage? How do I walk with? How do I invite God's presence into that space? And as you come forward and light a candle, maybe it's for that, that moment, that conflict. Maybe it's that Jacob and Esau moment that you need to have. Maybe it's one you've had that has left a mark on you that has changed the way that you see the world. But as you come forward today, listen to the music. Light a candle and invite God's presence alongside of you in the midst of whatever that reconciliation may look like for you. We are thankful to have a community that is, that is moved by reconciliation. Right now, that look, might look like education, that might look like action, that might look like volunteering for you. 
but we are a community of accountability. And your gifts help support the work that we do. And so as you come forward, we'll be offering plates at the table and other ways to give on the screen as well. And we are thankful for your gifts and how they support the work that we have set out to do as a community of faith called by God. Will you come? Bless the gifts our hands have brought, and bless the work our hearts have brought. Ours is the faith of the Lord, the rest of God is in our hand. Amen. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? God, in us and all around us, uh, we come for honest that we struggle, that we can feel um, like Jacob before the dawn, um, alone, 
feeling like all that we have and all that we are is our very life is on the line. God, we need reconciliation. God, uh, I pray that we would have that same tenacity that Jacob showed, that we would be willing to wrestle, uh, even with wrestle with you in the midst of our fear and our doubt, our anxiety, the violence that we've done, the violence that's been done to us. God, that we would wrestle and that we would not let go. God, that by the power of your spirit and through the power of community, accountability, that you would keep us in the wrestling. God, and that we would learn from the wisdom of, of one another when we see how some among us walk with a limp. God, that we've been changed God, that you've given us even a new name. You've made us new. And so, God, would we um, be honest with ourselves and the wounds of our past and, um, God, minister even out of those things to ourselves, to the world around us, to one another. God thinks that you meet us right there. Thanks, Jesus, that you came into our midst and that uh, you entered all the division and that you are the place where dividing line becomes gathering place by your grace. God, we pray for div divisions in our city, in our households, our workplaces, communities. God, we ask for your help in those places. I'm struck by Pastor Mike's thought that cost of your love and compassion, God, is that we would be changed. And it's true even for you, Jesus, that the cost of love and compassion was for you to suffer on our behalf. So God, open us up to the change we need. Meet us in those places, knowing that there is no future without forgiveness as Archbishop Tutu says, and that there's no forgiveness without your blessing. So keep us holding on. Pray especially for those in the struggle, those who grieve today. We ask for your hope. In Jesus' name, amen. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Closing hymn this morning.
Hello, yeah, there we go. Left, right, it's hard sometimes. In case it wasn't evident, I was very touched uh, by that hymn. And so as our benediction, receive this blessing and be tasked with this message. For everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, clean water and bread, a shelter, a space, a safe place for growing. For everyone born, a star overhead. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. May it be so. Let's go.